and welcome back. Now, here's the thing. Look at this little rotary dial here. Now, there's probably people watching this video who have never, ever seen one of these. Uh, because in these days of smartphones and push button dialing, these sort of things went out of date in, I don't know, probably the 80s, very early 90s, maybe. This is a dialing mechanism for an old fashioned telephone. In fact, on eBay, they're called vintage collectibles now. Hmm. I picked this one up for about five pounds. Um, it didn't say it was tested or anything, but I could see the pictures and it looked okay. And indeed, it does look okay uh, from the, the back. Now, I've welded it to the board here with some blue tack just so it didn't fall over. Um, as you can see, there are some connections here. We'll take the back off in just a sec. Um, let me show you, though, what it actually does when we start dialing, thanks to all these wires and things, which always, always look a lot more complicated than it really is in real life. And the reason it looks complicated is because we have to string bits of wire between boards. So let's see what it does. So here's an alternative debug window I've got. It's actually putty running here. So let me reset the Arduino. And uh, we should get a ready prompt. There we are, ready. So now we can dial a number. So let's let's dial a number. Um, let's make it short just for demo purposes. Um, one about one, two, three. One, two, three. And it says, you've entered one, two, three. Well, indeed I did. So let's see how we've managed to achieve that from a, a 1970s or 1980s telephone dialer. So this is the underneath of the dialing unit and it's it's fairly simple, very clever, but uh, fairly simple because what it's got is a set of points here and two sets of points over here. The ones over here make contact, they're normally open, you can probably just make out, they are in fact open at the moment. They make contact as soon as you move that dial from its resting place. And this one, which is normally closed, you can probably make out they're closed there, this one pulses open and then shut again by the use of that little cam there as it hits this thing here to give us a stream of pulses. So if we flip it over and dial a zero and hold it in place. Now what's happened straight away is that this contact here or possibly this one here, I can't remember which I'm using now, um, has gone closed. So we know that dialing is in fact in progress. And this one hasn't done anything yet, but you watch that contact as this cam comes round and bashes this here. So I'm going to let go. There, did you did you see that that point there get open and closed many times? Now, electronically, that's fairly simple, isn't it? Um, nothing more than a series of pulses, a bit like you could argue, like we get from a rotary encoder. Hmm. Interesting that. I wonder if we'll have the same problems that we had with the rotary encoder. That is to say, switch bounce. Which means that um, you might want one pulse from here, but you end up with two, three, four, however many it is. Hmm. We'll have to wait and see. Right, let me put this back on, because um, now that we've established that all it is really is a set of um, switches, um, well, there's not a lot more else to see there. Now, you can see the switch, the pulses a lot better on the JYE oscilloscope. It's amazing how useful this has become as part of my video. So I've set this up to um, to detect the pulses as we dial. Now, this is all going to be a bit cack because I'm trying to hold this in view and the dialer. But let's just um, put it round to four and then let go. Did you see that stream of pulses go across the screen, screen there? Watch again as I do it. Round to four, watch the screen. There they go, marching across. Now we can get a better view of those pulses just by looking at the oscilloscope when uh, it's on that holder now. So if I dial four, watch the oscilloscope, there they go, four little pulses trundling across there. Let's dial number six, probably get a better view six pulses and there they go marching across now the thing you may notice about those pulses is they are in fact lovely and square and i can tell you for now they are as square as you can ever make them because they're going through this little device here schmidt trigger let's have a look how they look um, before that schmidt trigger and we'll discuss why once again we have a schmidt trigger on here 
and um, a few components over here as well because well is it to do with switch bounce well of course it's to do with switch bounce we know that and um, as far as switch bounce goes this is probably about the worst I've ever seen in my entire life but we've cracked it right so I've connected that up now to the direct output from here as it goes into this small uh, number of components so let's dial number six and watch the scope and there we have them and as you can see they're of a definite different shape um, but it's not the shape so much that's the problem actually it's the it's the noise around those switches which we can't see on here it would be asking too much for that JYE to actually give us that detail but I can demonstrate what switch uh, bounce looks like very very easily just by using the scope I've got down in the workshop and using say a switch like this or like this or indeed any one of these they all exhibit switch bounce to some extent and of course the switch bounce is different from when you make the circuit and then break the circuit very different indeed or can be let's put it that way let's have a quick look at that just so you understand what the problem is with switch bounce and why you should really never ever connect a switch like this directly to an Arduino unless you you really have a, either a good switch or you know what you're doing in software to debounce it and I couldn't debounce this one in software it was just that bad really let's have a look what switch bounce is all about so here's a quick demonstration of some switch bounce um, I've wired up a switch to plus 5 volts um, brought it down with a pull down resistor as well so let's see what happens when I switch things on there we are perfectly square or so we think let's just zoom in on that square wave a minute so we're gonna zoom in we're going quicker and quicker and oh dear so it wasn't actually perfectly square at all in fact there was one two three pulses there before it remained on a typical example of switch bounce and this is on the switch on remember let's see what it's like on the switch off sometimes switches do behave totally different characteristics depending on whether you're switching them on or off right there we have the uh, complete wave so we'll stop that and zoom in this time on the trailing edge looking quite good so far yeah not bad 100 micros and that's pretty good actually that's just a slow ramp down well i say slow we're talking probably i don't know 10 microseconds something like that so switching off is pretty good it's the switching on that was the problem let's just have a look at this uh, wave again see if it made any difference oh dear no look at this this is the switch on oh, good lord just look at that now that would make any interrupt uh, on a microcontroller go absolutely berserk it obviously switch on multiple times because there are after all multiple pulses and even if you think well but they're tiny little pulses yes they are but then your microcontroller is supposed to deal with tiny little pulses isn't it there we are then typical example of switch mounts so there we have it that was a, a really good example of what switch bounce was all about and uh, I can't remember which one now was the best one out of this bunch. I think actually this little one, would you believe, the one I thought might be the worst, normally open, push to make and then release, that gave us the cleanest switch. The one I used in that demo, which was all over the place, was this one, which is a toggle switch. It's actually a center off two way, but um, whichever one I put it on, it was pretty awful on the make, wasn't it? On the break, it was fairly clean. Uh, and these, that was an old one I thought might have had a bit of wear in it but um, that was about the same as this other one uh, they all exhibited bounce to one extent or the other which was called havoc cause havoc really would um, in your programming so that's what switch bounce is all about and that's what this is giving out so if we were to connect this directly to our, our Arduino and try and count the pulses would it work well let's do it and find out what happens so we're going to connect the output of the dialer now directly into the microcontroller and just try and do a bit of software debouncing. So all I've got to do is on the interrupt pin, which we're using as pin 2, disconnect that, which has currently come from my Schmidt trigger. 
and the input which is going to that resistor capacitor network plug that directly into pin 2 that's it that's all the change we're making and as you can see it's all ready to go so let's let's start with a simple one it might work for the simple ones uh, number one hey look it worked number two and two yeah, we're doing well here perhaps we don't need any kind of deb uh, debout oh well three went to four let's try that again three oh dear it went to five that time hmm okay let's try a slightly bigger one six that went to seven what about ten Oh, 13 hmm okay let's not labor the point here it's it's tricky to do this I'm waiting for 10 milliseconds as you can see here before thinking that the next pulse must be a good one um, what should we take it up to well to cut a long story short um, because obviously I've been experimenting with this let's make it 50 okay and upload that now 50 milliseconds is frankly unheard of for switch bounce it's it's just too long and more to the point you're getting to the position where you might actually miss the next one because 50 milliseconds is quite a long time you know it's it's an appreciable amount of time it's not just five or ten milliseconds 50 is mm. so you might end up missing a pulse so therefore you will get well, I don't know, 10 and you'll read eight say and it all gets a bit tricky as to what pulse is and what it isn't but let's try this it's uploaded and done let's try number one again that worked last time didn't it one yeah see what I mean now we've just missed a pulse haven't we there was a pulse it's missed it we'll do it again ah worked two yeah that's working hey, it's working better now maybe three that's pretty good four yeah much better though it's five what about ten then yeah hey, it's pretty good isn't it eight yeah that's not bad actually it's not bad at all pity about that first one isn't it it definitely missed that let's try that one again though oh, I got it that time that's not bad at all not bad at all so if we enter a, a nice long number say um I don't know one one eight nine zero yeah get some nice long pulses there so one eight nine zero that might work let's have a look one eight nine zero well that's not bad is it so that's 50 milliseconds apart from that first one where it missed it the problem that we face here though is of course as you saw it's all a bit hit and miss are we getting a bounce are we getting a pulse should I but wait a bit longer should I read something else to determine whether that pulse is a true pulse or not a pulse uh, and in my experiments with this uh, I can also tell you that although 50 milliseconds is working now um, in an hour it might not I don't know why when you think about what's happening though inside here I mean this is as I say from the 1970s and 1980s and those those points on here um, they're not they're not just making and breaking are they as they're closing I'm going to have to use my finger for this but if you look at these points here uh, or better still these ones here because these are shut as the the little cam comes around to knock that off what happens is it's not a, a particularly clean break it sort of moves it microscopically up and down as well and these as well more so probably in these type of switches where you get a sort of a, a semi wiping action we're only talking you know fractions of a millimeter but that's enough of course so what happens is as as the cam comes round knocking this up to make a to make a connection and off it's it's just not that clean sudden break which is why you get the the well sometimes you might get a pulse sometimes you get a pulse and half a dozen and bounces along with it um yeah so it's all a bit hit and miss isn't it really and of course that wiping action may or may not give you a bounce or an extra an extra edge or indeed a complete pulse that you have to deal with just like that video we saw so what's a better way then rather than all this faffing about in code which quite frankly 
you know, quite a lot of people have said that, you know, this isn't this isn't the best way forward. We should be doing something in hardware. And indeed, that's what we have done. So let's go back to that. Now, I've been reading this um, PDF from Jack Gansler, who goes on about guide to debouncing and an extremely, extremely good read it is too. And um, I found a few things out and I've tried them out. And in fact, this is in fact what we see on our circuit board down here. It's simple in its, in its extreme, really. But the beauty of it is its simplicity and its cleverness. So on page 19, and it's probably easier for me to show you this in the browser rather than on the PDF. So let's get rid of that and go straight to the PDF. So what I'm going to do is scroll down to what is page 19. Well, before we get to page 19, here you can see... Um, a well not so typical switch debouncer actually because what he's got is a resistor here fine and the value for that works out to be something like 82k then he's got a resistor here before the capacitor normally the capacitor would go directly here but he's got a capacitor here a resistor here and that's 18k and then this capacitor is a whopping great one microfarad yes now I thought that might have been a misprint and I looked into it. Nope, that's what he's worked out. So we've got 82K, 18K and a one microfarad capacitor and there's your switch. Now that switch can be anything, as we've said. Any one of these switches I've got my workspace here, they're all exactly the same. Look, they connect to ground. Uh, so basically uh, make the switch to short out the input to your well, normally microcontroller, but on this particular instance, we're not doing that, are we? Uh, let me just adjust my video lights. That's better. Felt I was in a bit of a gloom there. So I looked at this, and then a bit further down, he says, actually, there's a better way, and this is it. This is the better way. So we still have the resistor plus the other resistor, so 82 and 18K, plus the one microfarad, and then you've got this diode here. Because as he said, sometimes when you're trying to work out these two values for a particular voltage on the gate on your Schmidt trigger, which is what this is, um, you start getting weird results. So by putting the diode across that resistor, you effectively eliminate that resistor for the charge time. The discharge comes from the capacitor through that resistor and back down to earth. Anyway, so I started making this, but in fact I didn't even put the diode across R2. I thought we'll try it without see how it works and put it into my um, old Schmidt trigger that I built for the rotary encoders so that's a CD4093 uh, dual input Schmidt trigger but we just add the inputs together join them together so they act as a single one like this here and the result was nothing less than astounding as you saw on the scope um, at the beginning of this video the square wave is a perfect square wave, no bounce, no jitter, no nothing. So we've gone from, you know, dozens and dozens of bounces uh, when you dial one of these to an absolutely perfect square wave. So does that mean then that we should now be able to eliminate any kind of software, uh, well, treatment of that bounce? Because after all, if the, if the pulse is now coming from a, a Schmidt trigger, what exactly are we debouncing now in software? And the answer is, of course, nothing. So we can eliminate all that. So let's have a look at the code. So this is the interrupt routine that we had when we found all those horrible pulses and bounces and things coming out. And now, as you can see, I've absolutely commented out all the, well, anything to do with, you know, should we be here and how long is it since we've been here and should I reject this pulse? not doing anything like that when this interrupt is triggered and the interrupt says oh yes we are in a dialing mode that is we have moved this dial round a bit so that the pin dialing pin is low then I'm going to count a pulse and um, well as you can see if we um, if we bring this over and connect it up not to putty have I still got putty running oh I have let's um, bring up putty then instead so here's the putty window, so the debug window, the serial monitor window. Okay, so I'm hoping it's all still connected. I can't work it out. Right, okay, let's just dial a couple of numbers. Six, two, 
one. And it says, you entered 621. And we did indeed. Now that's without any software debugging Debouncing. at all on the microcontroller. It gets a pulse. It trusts that pulse because we've done all the hard work, if you like, on the outside. A pulse is a pulse is a pulse. Unlike before, where a pulse may or may not be the one you want and you get dozens of them, certainly more than what you'd expect. So um, interesting, isn't it? Now, OK, so we've we've done all that work then and now we've managed to get this dialer to work. Well, pretty much 100%, I would say. Well, no, it is 100%. Oh, I couldn't get this to go wrong, by the way, since I've done this work. So that's excellent. So thanks very much much to uh, Jack Gansler. And I'll put a PDF and a link to his work, because if you're interested in debouncing in hardware, that is the book to read. And he's got a whole section on software as well, uh, which I haven't done yet, but I will do. Okay. Right. Having done that then, and having got a telephone dialer, what is it we can actually do with this? Well, I was thinking in practical terms, well, I say practical, is anything we build in Arduino world practical? It can be though, couldn't it? And at the very minimum, you can have something like a, um, a password entry system, couldn't you? Who would think that that telephone on your desk, or indeed this dialer put into a box, I mean, that'd be pretty imp simple, wouldn't it, to, to glue that into a nice little wooden box or something? Who would guess that that is in fact your password entry system? All right, it's a bit slow. It's not quite like punching buttons, isn't it, or swiping a card, but nice and retro, isn't it? And uh, don't be tempted to take low numbers. So, you know, if you wanted 9418, say, that's going to definitely pick those numbers up, although we're tracking here the pre-shaped pulses, and you're in. Not only that, though, you could you could probably use this for, well, Anything that you can think of that you would normally use either a keypad for or perhaps a swipe card for or something like that. And it's the whole point of this, of course, is it's a bit retro, isn't it? You just don't find things like this anymore. And I bet there's people watching this who have never, ever used a telephone with one of these. And uh, with good reason, because they were slow, as you can see, to dial a really long number. Can you imagine that? But today, well, we can use these to add value to a project. Um, I'm still trying to think what I'm going to use it for, if indeed anything, but I want to find a nice box to mount it in first because there's no actual mounting bracket, so I'd have to um, cut a round hole just a millimetre bigger than this plastic shield and just sort of slot it in and just with a, a dab of glue or something and uh, have it come out the back. Probably I'll probably put all this debouncing circuit uh, with it now, in case you missed the circuit for the CD4093, which in fact isn't the right chip to use in this instance. Yes, it is a Schmidt trigger, but not a simple one with a single single input uh, gate. Um, I'll put a link to the video for that as well on the screen there. We used it in our rotary encoder module. But uh, I have got one of those chips, the one I want, the SN74, I think it's 7414, something like that. Um, but I'll put a link on that as well. So that would be easy enough to do. So there we are. There's food for thought. Pick up one of these for a fiver or so from eBay or indeed your local car boot sale. Or what do they call it in the States? A yard sale or garage sale, something like that. But in the UK, we have car boot sales where, you know, basically a big field where hundreds of cars all turn up, set up trestle tables and sell their, well, bits and pieces like this from the most expensive to the absolute cheapest on a Sunday that is what we do in, in England yeah so ideas for you to think about and uh, well let me know what you do with it thanks very much for watching and see you in the next video I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting there are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below and if you'd like to subscribe to this channel just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos thanks for watching